Nothing can for sin atone. My hope is found in you alone. Sin and death are overcome only by your precious blood. Nothing good that I have done. No praise of mine could be enough. All my striving in vain, my righteousness found in your name. Only your blood has the power. There is no Lily, what a comforting words of promise. You know, um, in moments like this, when there is an easiness brought about by all these uh, unpredictabilities of pandemic, which uh, it triggers along, to hear the words of the worship song you just did, Lily, solves the heart. It's so soothing because of the love of Christ. 
and we're empowered by the Spirit of God to even have that grace to appreciate it. Thank you very much, Lily. How about uh, beginning this morning with a word of prayer? Father in heaven, once again, we truly thank you and praise you, Lord, for this privilege to once again serve you and worship you. Today, Lord, our speaker, Mildred, we lift her up to you, Lord. Thank you for anointing her. Thank you for the opportunity given to her in equipping her to lead us to the journey of this story of the great encounter. Lord, thank you for the empowerment. Thank you for being in our midst. And Lord, thank you for the blessings that you are already have bestowed to the listeners, to the viewers, to all of us. Thank you, O oh Lord God. Thank you for the grace. We give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, ladies. Welcome back to our Women to Women Tea and Talk Wednesdays. I'm pretty sure that you had ample time to reflect on the message shared to us last Wednesday. The treasures of the heart. What treasure do you keep in your heart? And the good news is that we have this eternal life given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? It reminds me, uh, Prophet Isaiah said that no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor heart received the things of God's precious things to those who love him. More so, if we truly love the Son of God, his treasure preserved for us whom we become heirs are beyond imagination. You believe that, ladies? So what a very, very hopeful promise. And we have to live up to this. But wait a second. I am not here to speak. And I will not preempt our speaker today. So without further ado, today, our speaker will share with us one of the great stories in human history. And that's the great encounter. Before anything else, let me call on our sister in Christ, Mildred Rimando. Take it away, Mildred. Hi, good morning, beautiful ladies. I hope and pray that we are all fine and doing good by God's grace, even in the midst of this challenging situation. We have been in this series, What Matters Most, and I hope we have been learning a lot from it so far. We're going to go, we, we've gone through six sessions already, right? For the past two months. And today is our seventh session. I entitled it, The Great Encounter. But before we dive into the Word of God, let's offer to Him our time together. Let's pray. Our gracious, loving Abba Father, we just want to praise and thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us, dear Father, to gather again this Wednesday morning and to come to study your word, dear Father. Without you, Lord Jesus, indeed we are nothing. So we completely surrender to you everything. I completely surrender to you, my being this morning, Lord. Be the one to speak through me, dear Father God. Let your Holy Spirit be the one to... Encourage each and every ladies here who are listening today, their father, to really come to you and find their hope and courage and meaning of life in you and in you alone. As we come to your word this morning, dear father, as we study the life of Saul who became Paul, Lord, we pray that you will all encourage us, that indeed, truly, our hope can only be found in you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We commit to you this time now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, in my talk today, I would like to share three points with you, my dear ladies. First, salvation is God's gift. Second, full surrender to Jesus Christ, God himself, leads to salvation. And the third is, salvation leads to a new person, a new life in Christ. In our lives, we encounter a lot of things. It can be as simple as daily chores, meeting new friends, 
or could be once in a lifetime kind of experience like this ongoing pandemic. In fact, an encounter can be uneventful, but the impact can be lifetime. Like perhaps when you met your husband, which could have been a chance acquaintance only, but that led to a lifetime union. Certainly, there were several encounters we had that changed the course of our lives. Some were great and joyful moments, while others were painful and even tragic. In our session today, we will look into the life of a great man of God. His name is Paul, who was previously named Saul. Our main passage in the Bible is in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 22. In this passage, we will see how the life of Paul took a pivotal turn on the road to Damascus. This was a remarkable event that eternally changed the life of Paul from persecutor to an apostle. And even so, it is also the time wherein the church was born. But before we dive into the passage, and for better perspective, let us try to know a bit more about Paul by taking a look at some personal details about him as revealed in the Bible. So as we go in Acts 22, verse 3 to 5, Paul said this about himself. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in the city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you are all today. Further, he said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, Paul said, Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee. Wow! What an impressive array of credentials, right? We can see from this passage that first, Paul was a highly educated person, an intellectual prodigy under the tutelage of Gamaliel, one of the highly respectful teachers of the law in Israel at the time. Second, an intelligent man trained in critical thinking and argument. You can somehow see this intellectual trait in the epistles that Paul wrote by how he scholarly and logically explained and defended the basis of his faith in Christ. Another, zealous for God. One more, a Pharisee. And last, Paul without a doubt, belonged to both the intellectual and religious elite of the Jews. With these impressive credentials, how did Paul initially devote his talent, influence, and passion? You are going to be surprised. So let's go now to our main text today and read Acts chapter 9, verse 1 to 2. Verse 1. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, verse 2, and asked for letters from him to the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, whether men or women, he might bring them in shackles to Jerusalem. In the early part of Paul's life, he was the forefront of persecuting Christians. Persecution of Christians was at the very core of his being. He was responsible for the death of many believers, in simple terms, a murderer. Wow, diba? So more than just being a religious and an intellectual elite, Paul was the great persecutor of the early church. He certainly was the emerging star of the Jews with ever-growing influence that he can even go directly to the high priest. To understand more of the zealousness of Paul, look at what the Bible narrates about what Paul did to the church in Acts chapter 8, verse 1 to 3. I want you to read with me, okay? So now Saul approved of, of putting Stephen to death, and on the day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. 
Verse 2, Some devout men buried Stephen and mourned loudly for him. Verse 3, But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and he would drag away men and women and put them in prison. As I was reading this, it's quite difficult to reconcile the fact that he was described to be zealous for God, but at the same time, persecutor of believers. Isn't that so contradictory? How can being a zealous for God and persecutor of believers coexist in a person? But that Paul was so zealous for God that he persecuted Christians. I don't have the same impressive credentials like that of Paul, not even 1% of his credentials, and I did not persecute believers. But I was once prideful in my religious heritage in the sense that I consider myself quote-unquote Christian since I grew up in a religious environment and practically and literally grew up in a church. But the truth was, I was a lost soul like Saul who, was, who became Paul until I encountered Jesus Christ. So continuing on this passage, on the road to Damascus, something extraordinary or supernatural happened. So let's go to Acts chapter 9, verse 3 to 5. Ladies, let's read with me. Now, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. At the height of Paul's seal to persecute the believers, Jesus personally appeared to him in the form of a sudden flash of light from heaven. The flash of light was so sudden and so bright that it caused Paul to fall to the ground as he heard audibly a voice. Jesus called on Saul's name twice. The repetition of Saul's name reminds us of how God typically addresses men in a critical moment, like how God called Abraham twice when God appeared to him. There, there you can see and check that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. To stop him from killing Isaac. Or when he called Jacob twice, telling him not to fear, not to fear. That's in Genesis chapter 46, verse 2. Or when he called Moses twice in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, verse 4, for a mission. This is indeed the critical moment in Paul's life, the turning point. That's why I entitled our session today, As the Great Encounter. Without wasting any time, Jesus made a direct question to Paul. Why are you persecuting me? Paul must still be shaken by the sudden flash of light, and then came this very direct question, accusing him of persecution. Paul managed to gather his thoughts together and ask, Who are you, Lord? As Paul persecuted Christians, he persecuted the body of Christ. Jesus being the head of the church. Jesus would want Paul to realize that as he persecutes the church, the Christians during the time, he is directly persecuting Jesus. This could have shocked Paul, for what he believed was that he's doing God a favor or pleasing God each time he persecuted believers. Remember, it was said of him that he has a zeal for God. Such zeal was not based on the truth at all. Now, he was confronted with the very person of Jesus Christ, God himself, whom he was persecuting. In Paul's response, we will notice that he addressed Jesus as Lord. He certainly sensed that he was in the midst of something supernatural that he may not be sure that his response was in the form of a question. This brings us to the high point of the story. I like this part because after witnessing Paul 
having this seemingly unhampered way in doing all the terrible things to persuade the church, Jesus finally caught up with Paul, stopped him blind on his track, and authoritatively introduced himself. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Wow! Can you imagine? Kayo, tayo kaya ang biglang magkaroon ng ganong encounter. What would we respond? Or how would we respond in such kind of an encounter? It was Jesus, he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. While meditating on this, it crossed my mind on how Jesus would introduce himself to me when I met him. Let's take out the word persecuting and replace it with our own situation. What would it be when he said, I am Jesus whom you are blank? Try to put a word in that blank in your own words. What are you going to put or what are you going to place in the blank? I, I came across some examples like, I am Jesus whom you are ignoring, disobeying, maligning, or loving, defending, obeying. So, it's up to you. Just put that description, whatever description you want in that blank. Paul did not have the chance to talk again as Jesus immediately gave him instructions. So we will see that in Acts chapter 9, verse 6 to 9. Verse 6, But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. Verse 7, The man who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Verse 8, Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. Verse 9. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Shortly after Jesus responded to Paul that he is Jesus whom he is persecuting, Jesus instructed Paul to enter the city, and it will be told to him what to do next. His travel companions were in awe of the, as they heard the voice of Jesus but they cannot see him. We see here that Jesus personally appeared to Saul, but not to his companions. Only Saul understood what was spoken to him by Jesus. Isn't this so amazing? A very exclusive and personal appearance to Paul or Saul at the time. As soon as Paul got up from the ground, now blind, he was brought to Damascus and there he fasted for three days. As he fasted for three days, Paul, le Paul fervently reflected on this great encounter as we see him praying later in the next verses. And the Lord started to prepare the heart of Paul for the purpose he planned for the life of Paul. This is our first point. Salvation is God's gift. This great encounter displayed God's sovereign control over man's plan for his great purpose. God's plan will always prevail and no one can thwart it. No matter how rotten one's past is, God's grace and mercy abound to us all sinners, even more so to Paul, who considered himself the foremost of all sinners. Why did I say so? He said in 1 Timothy 1, chapter 15, It is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. God's plan for salvation is clear, and He alone will accomplish it. Your rotten past, like Saul or Paul, does not disqualify you from His grace. Neither will your sterling credentials and achievements, like Saul or Paul, qualify you for his grace. It is by God's grace alone. John MacArthur said, 
Salvation is God's divine accomplishment, not of human achievement. And that is very true. As we continue, we see fully how God's divine plan is accomplished in Paul's life. So let's continue reading. Acts chapter 9, verse 10 to 14. Verse 10. Now, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. Verse 11. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Street, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Verse 12. And he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias, come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. Verse 13, But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many people about this man, how much harm he did to your saints in Jerusalem. Verse 14, And here he has authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. The Lord appeared to Ananias, a disciple in a vision, instructing him to go to the house of Judas to meet Paul, who was praying. At the same time, God showed to Paul in a vision a man named Ananias, who will lay his hands on him to regain his sight. What an amazing scene, showing God's divine plan at work. While Paul was praying for a miracle to regain his sight, God has already instructed Ananias and directed him to go to Paul. And then, the Lord revealed his purpose for the life of Paul. And we can see this in the following verses. Verses 15 to 16. Verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Verse 16. For I will show him much he must suffer in behalf of of my name. So Ananias followed the Lord's instruction even with much fear, knowing fully the reputation of Paul as persecutor of believers. So as we continue reading verse 17 to 19a. 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you in the, on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18. And immediately, something like fish scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight, and he got up and was baptized. And verse 19. And he took food and was strengthened. So what happened? So Ananias obeyed the Lord's instruction, right? And went to meet Paul and lay his hands on him. Upon doing so, three things happened. First, Paul or Saul regained his sight. Paul or Saul was filled by the Holy Spirit. And Paul was baptized. This is our second point. Full surrender to Jesus Christ, God himself, leads to salvation. We witness here the power of God's grace that leads to faith and total surrender to him alone. After his close encounter with the Lord, Paul, by God's grace, believed in Jesus and fully surrendered his life to Jesus. That's why he wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. Please read with me. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. In the last part of the passage, we now see what happened to Paul after becoming a believer. That's why he, in Acts chapter, 19, uh, chapter 9, verse 19b to 22, we read, now, for several days, he was with the disciples who were in Damascus. Verse 20, And immediately 
he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. Verse 21, All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not the one who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and have come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest? Verse 22, But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that, the, that this Jesus is the Christ. Finally, our third point. Salvation leads to a new person, a new life in Christ. We witness here the transforming power of the salvation by grace through faith, right? From the life of Paul, we had seen him transformed by the Lord from a persecutor to an apostle. We know from Scripture the faithful work of the Apostle Paul in declaring Jesus Christ until his death. God's purpose for him was faithfully accomplished. This is the proof that as a person leads a surrendered life to Jesus, he or she will eventually become a new person with a promise of eternal life in Christ Jesus through eternity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old thing passed away. Behold, new things have come. And in 1 John chapter 5, 11 to 12, And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. The time Jesus revealed himself to me over the years through personal encounters with him, Bible study, worship, fellowship, and ministry, my life has never been the same. It's a life of blessings and challenges, but at the same time, I know for certain that it's Jesus, God himself, have given me eternal life, and he is the one who holds my future in his loving arms. His presence will ever be before me. And that will also be with all of you as well. Allow me to just share with you my life verse. That's in Galatians 2, verse 20 to 21, which this is also an epistle, from an epistle of Paul. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live it by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. I fully understood I live and have my being only in him alone. In closing, the passage we have shared today of the great encounter of Paul with Jesus taught us three points. If I may say again, these points. Number one, salvation is God's gift. It's only by his grace. Second, who surrender to Jesus Christ, God himself leads to salvation and that is through faith. And the third, salvation leads to a new person, a new life, a transformed life. Let us pray. O oh, gracious, loving Abba Father, thank you so much for reminding us that truly indeed, salvation is a gift that only comes from you. It's only you and you alone who will cause our salvation. So, Lord, help each and every one of us here who are already your children and those who are not yet your children to really hear your voice and really come to the truth by going into your word, by diving into your word, Lord Jesus, so that they too would, meet, would encounter who you are, what you have done, and the greatest thing, O oh Lord, that you are our sovereign God, our Lord and Savior, who, will, who loves us so much and who wants each and every one to be saved. So, Lord, speak through your word 
And as we go from here, Lord, help us to be reminded that truly indeed, salvation comes from you alone because you are the only way, the only truth, and the only life. We thank you, dear Father, for your word that is so alive. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, ladies, before we leave, uh, there's a fast track. And at the same time, I would want to um, lead you to the discussion questions. So you read it. Uh, there are two discussion questions that you can discuss within your group. So thank you, ladies, for listening. I am truly blessed, Mildred. With such explanation, thank you. Thank you for sharing it to us. You know, Mildred, I have read many times, heard a lot about Apostle Paul. But did you know that while you were speaking, while you were sharing, the passion I could feel, and I was just awed and glued onto the message you shared with us. And to Further bolster the enlightenment that you already shared with us, Mildred. You know, I like to um, I like to uh, point out you made two polarizations in your statement. You made mention that um, the person's noxious or corrupt uh, experience in life does not automatically disqualify him from God's grace. Meanwhile, you also heightened the fact that man's achievement, an, a very impressive one, one, monumental as that, does not necessarily for this person to be given God's grace. Will you go ahead and clarify these two polarizations, Mildred? Yes, Malu, that is a very important point about God's grace of salvation, that our salvation is purely God's gift. For example, Zacchaeus, from defrauding the people as a tax collector, he encountered Jesus and became a believer. On the other hand, the rich man who did a real good work and became rich and claimed he followed all the commandments but was dismayed when Jesus asked him to sell all his properties and to follow Jesus. Our grave sins in the past do not deter our salvation, nor our being good or religious merits our salvation. What matter is that we have a personal encounter with Jesus and that we believe and surrender our lives to him. That's why in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as receive him, to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. His death on the cross paid all our sins, past, present, and future. What a great promise that the Lord Jesus Christ assures all those who believe in him, right? That's why in Romans 5 verse 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love, for, love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Awesome love of God, Mildred. In other words, what you're sharing with us, and many of us may perhaps already know about this, mm -hmm. that this grace, this salvation cannot be earned, mm -hmm. nor is it just deserving for all of us sinners, but because of God's love for us. Mm -hmm. Such grace has, be has been bestowed on us. Yes. Praise God for that. Okay. You, you know, you, you uh, shared with us a lot of salient points worthy of further discussion, Mildred. But i like to point this out. You also said that there is that transformative power mm -hmm. where a man saved by Jesus Christ will definitely have a new life. Uh -huh. Explain this to us. How is this enhanced? What is this new life? Yes, Mildred, please. Okay. You know, a person who has a personal encounter with Jesus 
will attest really to the transforming work of the Holy Spirit in her life. She will hunger and thirst for God's word, which will eventually result to obedience and will have a godly perspective about how to live an abundant life in Christ. That's why there's a verse in the Bible that says, John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Holy Spirit will indeed work in the life of a true believer, and that will transform her life in the process as she continues to really delve on or dive in the word of God daily and at the same time uh, be empowered by the Holy Spirit if she will be able to really uh, fill with the Holy Spirit, she will, she will completely surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit and transformation will come. Yes, yes. I cannot further say anything more than this. I am truly blessed. Ladies, it is such a wonderful session hearing the message of the great encounter. We all know that um, such encounter by Paul is amazing, awesome, well-read. Um, you know, Paul, Apostle Paul is the looming character in the book of Acts, right, Mildred? And Very he, true. Yes, Very true. he dominated the whole thing. So, so encouraging. Uh, Apostle Paul said, follow me because he followed Christ. Exactly. So very ladies, if you are blessed, Thank you, Mildred. I am very, very blessed. And I'd like to spur and encourage our viewers today. So ladies, I'm sure you have been blessed. And if you think you have been blessed and are blessed and were blessed, don't keep it in your heart. Share it with your friends, with your loved ones, with your relatives. And if you think you feel a little bit anxious because your loved one is not with you today and you wanted them to hear it don't fret right Mildred because yes. we have our Facebook right Facebook page Facebook. and our YouTube yes and and aside aside from this right Mildred we have all the messages stored up in those um links right correct and that's correct you can have your unlimited time and best time to relax and listen and be blessed by mm. all the messages that the W2W has prepared for all of you. Now, Mildred is basically the penultimate speaker, meaning second to the last speaker. It is not enough for now. There will be more. And you know what they say? The best is safe for the last. But of course, everything is best, what you have heard. And this is going to be viewed and shown on, Mildred, you know the date? June 16. Yeah, that's right. That's June 16. Yeah. And yes, do not miss this because our speaker is one who is very interesting and very knowledgeable on that topic. Mildred, do you remember? Do you remember the title? It is God's unchanging love if you think you have seen this great encounter now watch see and feel the unchanging love of god to be shared to us by our sister in christ cindy soriano on june 16 save the date and don't miss it all right and uh, before we close and listen to this ladies the discussion questions shall be flashed again on the big screen. So you will have time to do that. And uh, right now, why don't we close in the words of prayer? Father in heaven, you are our amazing God. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord God, for the love that you have given us, that you have sent your only begotten son to die for us, mm -hmm. to be the propitiation for our sins. Thank you for the model that you have sent us, the life of soul, mm. who at the end has been transformed and now known as Apostle Paul. 
Mm-hmm. Lord, he spurred us. He galvanized us to go ahead and follow him because he followed you. Father, thank you for being in our midst. Thank you for the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the renewal, Lord, for those who love you and who mm-hmm. call upon your name and who believe you. Father, thank you for the transformation. Mm-hmm. Lord God, we love you and thank you for the blessings. We give mm-hmm. you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' mighty name. We all say amen, amen, amen. and amen. amen. Thank you, ladies. Mildred, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. To God be the glory. Ciao, ladies. God bless. Bye. Bye.